Welcome back to Chem 4300. In this video, we're going to begin chapter 17 on the quantum mechanics of rotational motion. Now, in the last chapter, we worked out the angular momentum operators for a single quantum particle moving relative to some fixed origin. In this chapter, we're going to examine the quantum mechanics for the rotational motion of a system of particles, and those particles in the system have fixed positions relative to each other. This was a situation that you may remember is called the rigid body. Now, in chapter four, we discussed the classical mechanics of describing the rotational motion of a rigid body, and now would be a good time to go back and review that material. Many of the concepts introduced in chapter four will be used as we set up and solve the Schrodinger equation for the rotational motion of a molecule here approximated as a rigid body. Now, of course, no molecule is a rigid body, but the deviations from rigid body behavior are going to be small enough that we can treat them by perturbation techniques. So let's begin by looking at the rotational angular momentum operators for the quantum rigid body. If you remember back in chapter four, we examined the angular momentum of a system of particles, and we saw that the angular momentum can be divided up into two contributions for that system of particles. There was an orbital contribution and a spin contribution. And the example that we gave back then was of, say, the Earth, which is orbiting around the sun. So the angular momentum of the Earth orbiting around the sun with the sun de defining the origin is this L orbital contribution, and then the Earth spinning about its axis as it does this orbit, the Earth's angular momentum as it spins about its axis is this contribution here. So we're gonna uh, take, take the same approach when we're des describing a molecule, except now I'm gonna write those two contributions as the angular momentum associated with the molecule translating relative to some origin, because the molecule may not be orbiting around any particular fixed center, but it will have angular momentum depending on how we define the origin. And then there'll be an angular momentum associated with the, the molecule rotating about its center of mass. So this L translational is the angular momentum associated with the center of mass of the molecule relative to some fixed origin. And the J rotation is the angular momentum associated with the body rotating about its center of mass. Now, with, as, as before, with no external torques applied to a good approximation, we know that the, uh, the two contributions will be separately conserved, because with no torques, remember, there'll be t conservation of the angular momentum. And the two contributions will be separately conserved to a pretty good approximation. Now, what we're going to do in this chapter is we're going to approximate the molecule as a rigid body, and we're going to describe its motion with three translational coordinates to follow the center of the mass, and then three rotational coordinates to follow the orientation of the moment of inertia tensor principal axis system. So that means we're going to need the Euler angles of theta, uh, phi, theta, and chi. All right. So the angular momentum vector components for the rigid body about some center of mass system are going to be given in terms of the space fixed frame and the body fixed frame. Now we've talked about those again in chapter four, so we're gonna have two sets of components for describing the one angular momentum vector. So in the body fixed frame, we're gonna define JA, JB, and JC, which are the angular momentums associated with the principal axes of, uh, for the moment of inertia tensor. And I'm just gonna give you this result without derivation these are what those operators look like for those three components, for JA, JB, and JZ, in terms of the Euler angles describing the orientation of our molecule as a rigid body. Now, similarly, we have to know the operator's components in the space fixed frame, and these are given here, and this is JX, JY, and JZ, and here they are given in terms of the Euler angles uh, just as we did before. Now, make sure you look at these. You see there are some differences here. You see that there's a sign difference here, but they look pretty much the same otherwise, okay? So these are the two sets of operators for the components in the body fixed frame 
and the components and the space fix frame that we'll be working with in this chapter. Now, those components describe exactly the same vector quantity, and so that means that they will have to be related to the total length of the vector. So we know that jx squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to j squared, and similarly, ja squared plus jb squared plus jc squared will be equal to j squared. So you can use either this formula and this formula and the equations from the previous page to get the operator for j squared here. Now, there's some very interesting commutator relationships here for the rigid body. So as you might expect, we have the, the, the components of the space fix frame which do not commute. So jx, jy doesn't commute and gives you a non-zero value of i, h bar, j, z, and then similarly for uh, the other components here. Similarly, in the body fix frame, we're going to have that the components of the angular momentum do not commute either, and you can see that there's a difference between these sets of commutators. They, j, a, and j, b do not commute and give you minus i, h bar, j, c. So similar to what happens in the uh, space fix frame, but there's a sign difference here. So that's important. So we see that they do not commute in the space fix frame and they do not commute in the body fix frame. But what's also interesting is that the components in the body and the space fix frame do commute with each other. So JX, for example, commutes with JB. So even though JX and JY do not commute, JX and JB do commute. So that's important. And what we find then with all of these commutators and the fact that j squared, the, the, the length squared, will commute with the components in the body, body fix frame and will commute with the components in the space fix frame and the components in the, in the space and body fix frame commute, then what we learn is from these commutators and the uncertainty principle is that for the rigid body, the quantum rigid body, you can simultaneously know the angular momentum vector length j, uh, I'm sorry, j squared, one body fixed frame component, so one of these components, and one space fixed frame component. Right? So that's what's knowable in this quantum mechanical problem. So just like before with the, when we talked about in the last chapter, we, we could only know one component in the length. Well, in this case, we can know one component in the length but we get to know one component in the space frame, fixed frame, and one component in the body fixed frame. All right. Great. So let's move on to what those eigenvalues are. Now, we worked out sort of a procedure for determining the eigenvalues uh, for the angular momentum operators in the previous chapter, and you can apply those in the same way here. And what you would find is that the components for the angular momentum in the space fixed frame would have eigenvalues of mj h bar times, you know, that's the eigenvalues, so this is what happens when you operate on the wave function. And so these mj values go from minus j to plus j, and that should look familiar here. Notice I'm going to use a capital M here. Now that's for the, for the space fix frame. For the body fix frame, we're going to have similar behavior. So in order to avoid confusion, instead of calling this one mj space and, and mj body, I'm just going to use mj for the space fix frame and kj for the quantum number for the component in the body fix frame. So, to, so this is a new notation that we're going to see in this chapter here, but just keep in mind that these are the, the angular momentum component quantum numbers that are multiplied times h bar to give you the eigenvalues that, that are possible. So mj goes from minus j to j, kj goes from minus j to j. All right. Now, the total angular momentum operator, uh, when we do j squared, has an eigenvalue of j times j plus 1 times h bar squared, where j is the angular momentum quantum number j, which can take on values of 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. OK? So now we come to taking those operators and constructing our kinetic energy expression. And here you see the kinetic energy that we uh, had from chapter four for the classical description of rotational motion. And our 
story here is going to be pretty much the same. We're just going to put hats on these guys. And if I put hats on them and write down the Schrodinger equation, h psi is equal to e psi, then this gives me the differential equation I have to solve. And remember, now we have those expressions for these operators on the previous slides. So these Euler angles are, again, in the solution to this differential equation are what define the molecule's orientation um, relative to some space fixed frame. Now, in quantum descriptions of rigid body motion, it's pretty common to re-express the Hamiltonian in terms of parameters that are used more often in, say, rotational spectroscopy or uh, different types of microwave or vibrational spectroscopies. And so what we see here is that we're going to rewrite the previous Hamiltonian in this form where we define new constants that, that hold the principal components of the angular of the moment of inertia tensor. And so we're going to define A, B, and C, which hold the principal component A, uh, B, and C. And these guys are what are called rotational constants. And defined this way, they give us un uh, con numbers which have a dimensionality of frequency. So that actually is handy when you're working with spectroscopy and you're measuring uh, the, the frequencies of transitions. It's nice to have these constants in the same dimensionality there instead of working with the moment of inertia uh, principal component values. Similarly, a lot of times people will work uh, in, if you remember from your IR, people instead of working with frequencies, they work with wave numbers. And so that's going to be also another way of representing this. So sometimes it's redefined this way where the constants A, B, and C, and I'm going to put a little tilde over the A, B, and C to distinguish them from the rotational constants. These are what are called wave number rotational constants, and they're just these constants divided by the speed of light. And these will be used very often when you're doing any kind of spectroscopy and looking at rotational transitions. All right, so that's it for this part of the video. And what we're going to do next is to take what we've just learned about the angular momentum operators and the Hamiltonian for the rigid molecule and see if we can look at what the eigenvalues and eigenstates are for the Hamiltonian for these various cases.